Hey everyone, this is Onya. This is our next video in the study on the Book of Jubilees. Last teaching we discussed many interesting details that Jubilees reveals to us regarding the chronology and genealogy, especially as it relates to Genesis chapter 5. And I did an in-depth comparison of of the different witnesses of Genesis chapter 5, linking it with the Book of Jubilees numbers. In this video, I discuss the connections of chapter 11, Genesis chapter 11, with Book of Jubilees, and I give the I give a little bit of information for the different versions of Genesis chapter 11, and then uh, explain why I think Jubilees different numbers as it compares to Genesis. I think that Jubilees is the more correct version. And I explain why I think that. I also touch upon in the video the naming and family connections. Like, what's interesting about Jubilees is it's one of the few writings that actually purports to give the names of the names of the wives, the names of the women that the patri various patriarchs married. And we know a few of them from the Bible, like Sarah, obviously, and Rebecca, and Rachel and Leah, but in general, you know, and Eve, you know, but uh, in general, most of the names of the wives, we don't know from the regular scriptures. But Jubilees reveals to us the name of each man's wife, all the way from Adam down to, um, down to Moses. So, that's a, that's a, um, important piece of information that Jubilees reveals to us. And so I discuss that in this video, and then I also touch upon what, why Abraham's family was named what it what they were named. There's a huge story about how Abraham's family was named after various relatives in his family. Like, for example, just the one that's the most prominent is Abraham was named after his mom's dad. So his his maternal grandfather, he, Abraham was named after the name Abram is literally the same name that and he was named specifically after, in honor of, his maternal grandfather. His brother Nahor was specifically named, um, specifically named Nahor in honor of the very same exact named person, Nahor, who is Terah's father, which it would be Abraham and Nahor's paternal grandfather. And there's so many more, uh, examples of this type of thing in Abraham's uh, family. His brothers and nephews and nieces, they all have connections to family or land, which is just very interesting. So I touch upon, I touch upon that in this video series. So that's about it, what I discuss in this, and um, if you listen through it, you'll find it very interesting and insightful information. Now, with all that said, I'm not going to go in in depth into the Patreon thing this time, because I'm kind of tired this week, but uh, I'm just going to say that I have a $25 supporter and uh, on Patreon, and his name is Daniel Simpson, and then I have another $10 supporter who sends through PayPal. You can send through Patreon or PayPal or any number of methods if you feel led to donate. On a regular basis, so um, there's different levels for the donation. You have the one dollar level, the ten, twenty-five, fifty, hundred, two fifty, five hundred, and a thousand. Those higher levels, I don't expect anyone to do them, but they're there in case anyone wants to bless the ministry and also. Um, I give much better rewards for the higher levels. So, anyways, if you're interested, you can go to patreon.com/slash Dead Sea Scrolls Religion, 
and you can find my Patreon information there. With that said, I hope you enjoy this video, and uh, peace to you all. Greetings, I'm Jackson Snyder. I'm doing this little video to ask you to consider coming with us, the Vero Essien Yahad, for Sukkot this year, 2018. We'll be Sukkoting in Chattanooga, Tennessee, at the Booker T. Washington State Park there. And we're going by the Essene calendar, that is the Enochian solar calendar. So our Sukkot is from October 2nd through the 10th, 2018. And I'd ask you to consider that. The details of our Sukkot are found here. www.theyahad.net That's T-H-E-Y-A-H-A-D www.thesukkot I'm sorry, theyahad.net. Yes, well, it is the Sukkot. We've got a great lineup of speakers and a great lineup for fun. This is an in-gathering. This is the time we all get together with our Facebook friends from the Vero Yahad, the think tank, etc., and enjoy each other's company, teaching, fellowship, and really good food. I hope to see you there. It's like 9.40 here, so it's pretty early. Oh, uh, um, so, as other times I've done these teachings, uh, on occasion I cut out because of the internet. If that happens, I typically get back in within a few minutes, so just be patient if that happens. Uh, we're, this is continuing the series of Jubilees that we've been doing for a while, and I'm trying to go through and point out the interesting aspects of the Book of Jubilees from the perspective of it being an authority, because that's, I, I read Jubilees as an authoritative text on similar level as Genesis. Um, many people in the Hebrew roots and just people who follow the Bible, they don't have that level of authority that they ascribe to Jubilees, but I think that's a mistake. I think Jubilee is a very important text, and for the Had, we're trying to study the Jubilees to, we're, we're focusing on the Dead Sea Scrolls a lot, and believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls forms a ancient link to the original faith of the Apostles. So studying texts like Jubilees helps give us insight into what the faith of the Apostles was and trying to emulate that and learn any potential lessons from it. So that's why we're doing this series. Last time we focused primarily on gene genealogy differences. There's a f there were a few other things I wanted to say about that. Last time I went into a lot of detail, this time I'm not gonna go into too much detail uh, on those things, but I'm gonna just point out a few interesting things that we can glean from the genealogy uh, information that Jubilees reveals to us. So, like I mentioned in the last teaching, in the Samaritan version, it's unique in that the patriarchs from Shem all the way to Noah, it actually gives the total years. Like it says, it says um, how many years they were when they had their their son how many uh years after they lived and then how many years in total they were when they died that's is, is that original in there or is that an addition i believe it's original but it's only in the samaritan uh copies it's it's not in the, the masoretic or the septuagint so the reason i think it's original is because it's the same you see the same thing in in Genesis chapter 5 in all three versions, you see it in the Masoretic, Septuagint, and Samaritan. So, um, like what you were just talking about with the whole consistency thing, it would make sense that the original was more consistent in 
the same genealogy uh, framework of Genesis 5, that same framework is in Genesis 11. So it would make sense that it would be the same setup, and it is the same setup in the Samaritan. Uh, to me, it, like, it makes more sense for scribe. I, I believe in a principle for scribal uh, textual criticism that a lot of it seems a lot of the scholars don't agree with this idea, but I think it makes sense to me. And that's basically the principle of laziness, where scribes had a huge motivation to be lazy because they had to copy everything out by hand. So, and I know from my, from my own work, I start out being very detailed, very uh, extreme in information in the beginning, but then as I continue writing out the document, I start getting tired and I start cutting corners because it's a bit of a drag to do all those details a million times. The first, the first a thousand times I could do the excessive detail, but after a while it gets repetitive. So sometimes it's easy to cut corners. And I think that's what happened a lot of times with the scribes in the, in the various witnesses we have of the different books of scripture, we do see evidence of laziness where Texts like the Septuagint and other, like Samaritan, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, they contain, they contain repetitive, uh, repetitive uh, information that would make sense for people to be like, okay, we don't want to write this a billion times. We'll just, uh, we'll just uh, take the, we'll take the repetition out because we don't need the repetition. Um, for because you know, as I said the other time. If you take four plus seven, you know that equals 11. So you could write it out for someone, four plus seven equals 11, or you could just say four plus seven, and you know that the reader probably has a basic understanding of math and can, can do the total themselves. So anyways, all that to say, the importance of the Samaritan Torah I spoke of last, last session, and it appears that the Samaritan preserves the original totals because the to the all the numbers for Genesis chapter five for the Samaritan agree exactly with Jubilee's numbers, so and it also gives the totals. So the totals for the Samaritan of Genesis chapter five we can trust. That makes me believe that we can also trust the totals of the Samaritan version for uh, Genesis chapter eleven. Now, Genesis chapter 11 is more complicated than Genesis chapter 5 because with chapter 5, the Samaritan agrees with Jubilees every time. But with chapter 11, Jubilees disagrees with all three, all three witnesses of Genesis. It completely, uh, hold on, I need to, let me see. Mute conversation. Some someone's doing this thing, like this weird group post that keeps sending me a message. So I just gotta. Um, yeah, I got one too. I just bugged out of it. Yeah, I'm just. I don't know any of those people. <laughs> it was like 120 people that they sent it to. That's crazy. Uh, anyways, so. What's a peculiar thing that we spoke on last time is in the three different versions of Genesis chapter 5, the numbers differ, but they all seem to try to be adding up to the same total most of the time. That same phenomenon occurs in uh, Genesis chapter 11 between the three witnesses. They all try to add up to the same, roughly. So that suggests that... Uh, these totals are not random, but these totals are probably close to the original, and it's the exact numbers that are adding up to it, the total, which are in question. So that can help. Uh, the totals, I think, are very important for trying to figure out what the, the full lifespan of these individuals are. Now, a <clears throat> interesting thing of the totals, or not, yeah, the totals for the chapter 11 
The Samaritan and Masoretic always agree on the totals. The Septuagint, however, usually differs for some reason. The totals differ. So for our fact set, for example, the total is 438 for the Samaritan and Masoretic, but the Septuagint has a total of 565. And then we talked about how Canaan, there's an extra generation in the Septuagint and in Jubilees, that's Canaan. Septuagint gives the total as 460. Then for Sela, the total is um, 433 years for uh, the, the Masoretic and Samaritan and 460 for the Septuagint. Eber, the total is 404 for the Hebrew witness, and the Septuagint is 464. So that's a difference of 60. So obviously there must have been some scribal mistake there because you know how you have 404, 464. That's very similar. That can't be coincidence. That must be either a scribal error, accidental, uh, misreading a number. Peleg, it's 239 for the Hebrew. The Greek is 339. So now, for, for the rest of these figures, or for the next three figures, the Septuagint has 100 years more in the total than the Masoretic and Samaritan. Normally, like in chapter 5, it wasn't 100 years extra in the total. It was 100 years extra in how old they were when they had their son. But that doesn't happen um, uh, all the time. I had a, okay, that happens also with uh, chapter 11. But in addition, it also has an extra 100 for the total for the Septuagint. So uh, based on that, it, it definitely seems like the Septuagint is not correct because it, it's adding an extra 100 that should not be there. So... So as I said, Peleg was 239 in the Hebrew, 339 in the Greek. Reo, 239 and 339. Serug, 230 and 330. So you see that 100 extra in the total. Nahor, 148 in the Hebrew. And in the Greek, Septuagint, 304. So it's very wildly different in the Septuagint for Nahor. Tera is um, let's see here. Tara is 145 for the Samaritan, 205 for the Masoretic, and 275 for the Greek. So Tara differs widely as well. So with all those differences, how do we make sense of, of uh, which one's the original? Well, I, as I said, I think Jubilees is very reliable in, in much of its information. And I think we can use Jubilees to weed out which one is correct and which one's not. So some interesting things when we look at this information. Septuagint has Shem dying before any of his descendants die. So you would expect from a family lineage uh, the father to die before the son. Um, that's, that's typically how it happens in, in nature. So that, that's a positive for the Septuagint. It has a plausible father dying before their son in every case for the Septuagint. The Masoretic is highly improbable. The Masoretic has Shem dying after all his descendants die, even Abraham. So in the Masoretic, Shem keeps living until he sees all his descendants die up to the time of Abraham. Even Abraham dies. And then after Abraham dies, then Shem dies. That is very unlikely. Um, and that's, that's what the Masoretic rabbinic tradition, though, bases their uh, ideas on Abraham meeting Shem and uh, saying that Shem was Melchizedek, for example, that's only based on that highly unlikely Masoretic uh, chronology. How that happens, um, 
Well, so in chapter 11, Samaritan and Septuagint typically have the same number of years for how old the person was when they had their, their son. In the Masoretic, it's usually 100 years less than what the Septuagint and Samaritan say together. And then Jubilees, as I said, doesn't agree with either of the three in how old they were when they had the son. So Jubilees is like in a middle, uh, in a middle form. And uh, I, I think the it makes more sense for, like, I don't see why Jubilees would take, like, Jubilees agrees with the Samaritan, as I said in Genesis chapter 5, for uh, every date. It wouldn't make sense for Jubilees author to then look at Genesis chapter 11 and say, oh, I don't like any of those dates. I'm just going to make, make up my own dates and just make up random dates. That doesn't make sense. Uh, it makes more sense that Jubilees was based on a very different version of Genesis or, or that Jubilees and Genesis like, are both derived from, like as I said, Genesis Apocryphon. Um, but that, that the Genesis that was original was very different than the Genesis we have today and that it's been altered over time. And that the Genesis, the original Genesis was closer to Jubilees. So, um, let's see here. Uh, so that, to me, I think it's more plausible. We have strong evidence that the scribes altered Genesis for polemical reasons. The reason we know that is because it can't be accidental changes because the numbers add up. In most of the versions, the numbers are adding up to the same totals. It's just the different numbers adding up to it are changing. So that can't be accidental. It has to be intentional changes. And why would they intentionally change the numbers? They change the numbers intentionally because they're trying to force it to fit their particular opinion about something, either their perspective about history, how it all fits together. They definitely have an agenda that they're trying to fit. Jubilees doesn't seem to be having that same agenda. It seems that Jubilees is, is completely independent in, an, in that the, the scribes are not trying to alter Jubilees to force it to fit a particular theory. Uh, so that's what goes in Jubilee's favor is there isn't evidence of foul play with the numbers in, in Jubilee's in the same way there is in the Genesis numbers. So I think we can trust Jubilee's numbers more for that reason. But I says, I said, I do think we can trust the totals. So I think we can take the totals of the Samaritan and the, we can take the year each man was when they had their son in Jubilee's and we can take that combine it with the Samaritan totals and reconstruct the original numbers for chapter 11. I believe that, uh, that we can do that confidently. Now, in the S Samaritan, Shem dies after his son Arphaxad dies. So basically, um, Shem dies... Uh, just dies before all his descendants die, with the exception of his son. So that's more real. That, that that's also realistic. That that's not implausible. To some, some fathers die before. Uh, I mean, some some fathers have their sons die before they die. That that has happened. Um, that's not implausible. And Jubilees, um, as I uh, Jubilees does not say how long they lived um, until. Uh, after they, Ju Jubilees, uh, all right, Jackson, you said, uh, among the three stooges, Shemp died second after Curly. Uh, yes, that is very, thank you for interrupting us with that important uh, information in the comment section. <laughs> um, so with Jubilees, uh, how long each person lives after they have a son is not specified, but if my theory is correct that the, that the totals are reliable, then we can have an idea of, of how long each person lived after they had a, a son. And if we take that, then what we, what we have is 
Um, here's what we have in the four, four witnesses for Abraham, for example. Um, Abraham was born, in the Septuagint, Abraham was born after Serug and everyone before died. Serug is Abraham's uh, grandfather, I believe, yes. Um, no, wait, great-grandfather. Um, the Samaritan has Abraham born after Reu and Reu or Serug is um, right around that time. Uh, Abraham uh, is born after uh, them and everyone before it died. That's in the Samaritan. And the Masoretic, as I said, that one's all wacky. Masoretic has every single one of Abraham's ancestors still alive when Abraham was born. Again, not, not very plausible. Um, Jubilees has Abraham born only when, um, so the people who are born when Abraham, I mean, the people who are alive when Abraham is born is Abraham's father, Terah, his grandfather, Nahor, his great-grandfather, Serug, which is plausible to have to be alive when your great-grandfather is still alive. And then, um, Aber. Aber is a few generations back, and um, the reason I think Aber might have been alive when a Abraham was, it, it, that's only possible with uh, Jubilees chronology to, for Aber to still be alive and, and Masoretic. Um, the reason I think Aber, Aber might have been alive is because the whole uh, definition of Hebrew is strongly linked with Eber. And you have in Genesis, for example, it says the, the sons of Shem were children of Eber. Why is it connecting it with Eber? I think it's because Eber might have still been alive when Abraham was alive. And it says that Ab in Jubilees, it says that Abraham was given the scriptures of the fathers. It doesn't say who gave them to him, but it says he had the books of his fathers. So it would make sense if Abra was the one who gave Abraham the scriptures, it would make sense for Abraham to consider himself, uh, Ab Abra and his descendants to be considered the Hebrews and for the Hebrew language, like the, the name for that to originate. Um, uh, so that, that, that's my theory. I don't know if that's, that's true or not, but um, Jubilees suggests that Aber was still alive and that uh, Peleg, um, yeah, so Ju Aber was alive when Abraham was, uh, hold on, let me see. Okay, the question is, have I calculated the difference in total years that the Septuagint adds to the genealogies compared to Jubilee, Samaritan, and Masoretic. Um, oh, um, I haven't written it down, but I mean, there's a website, you know, on, like for example, Wikipedia points it out. And for example, it has the birth of Abraham, like for the Masoretic, 1948, the Samaritan, 2,249 years after creation is when Abraham was born. Septuagint, 3,414 years after creation was when Abraham was born. So Septuagint differs wildly. Jubilees has uh, Abraham born 1,881 years. So it's closer to actually Masoretic. Um, it's actually fewer years than the, than the Masoretic. The reason why it's fewer is because, so like I said last time, the differences for the flood, Jubilees agrees with the Samaritan that the flood happened about 1,300 years after creation. Masoretic has 1,600 years uh, after uh, when the flood happened. 
and Septuagint has 2,250 years when the flood happened. So if Jubilees agrees with that 1,300, that small number, but then Septuagint and Samaritan, they both add 100 years for each of the people after the flood. The Masoretic has 100 less than the Samaritan. So, so for the Samaritan, for the people from Shem all the way to Abraham, it's about 900 years, 950 years, yeah. that span. The Masoretic has that span as like, um, as only short, a little less than 300 years because it subtracts 100 from each person. So if you subtract 100 from like 10 people, uh, that you, you can see why it's uh, so, uh, so much less time in the Masoretic. So you have the 1600 plus about 300 that's where you get the 1950 in the Masoretic when Abraham was born. Um, Jubilees takes the smaller number for cha chapter 5 of the Samaritan of Genesis, the 1300 number, and then it takes a bigger number than the Masoretic for the, the people from Shem to Abraham. It, it has a number closer to, uh, closer to 600 years uh, between, between the flood and Abraham's birth. So when you take that all uh, in, it has Jubilees dating Abraham's birth to around 1880. So hopefully that answers the question. And uh, it keeps, the Septuagint keeps prolonging the information in uh, like in the other books too, where like, for example, if you look at Josephus, uh, you see some alterations as well. Josephus keeps adding extra years in the manuscripts of Josephus. So uh, when you get to when the Messiah supposedly came, um, I mean, when he did come, supposedly the Septuagint says, when you add up the dates in the Septuagint, the Messiah came 5,500 years after creation. The Masoretic and the Jubilees have it very close to around 3,800 years after creation. Samaritan has it more like, more like, uh, let's see, Samaritan would have it at about um, 41, 4,200 years after creation. Um, so I would say the Septuagint is, like I mentioned the last time, I suspect that the reason they altered the Septuagint was because they were trying to reconcile it with, with history, of uh, like the history of Egypt um, and the history of the Greeks. That would, be, that would be a strong motivation to change it because the people who accept the scriptures, they don't want people to reject the scriptures. They want people to think it's historically accurate. So they would have motivation to be like, okay, the scriptures in our current copies are contradicting history. So we got to fix the scriptures. And they, it would make sense if they're trying to fix the scriptures, it would make sense that they're not altering it to random dates, like completely random dates out of nowhere. It would make sense if they like altered it by hundreds. Like, oh, maybe if we alter it by a hundred here and there. They're, they're trying, the scribes tried to alter as little as possible because they didn't want to completely change the message. They sometimes wanted to tinker with the message, but they didn't want to completely make an co entirely contrary message to the original. They tried to tinker it, usually. There are exceptions where the scribes radically changed the, what the meaning is, but most of the time, their purpose was not to change completely what it was saying, but was to simplify it or to slightly correct it based on their particular belief of the passage. Um, so it would make sense if they thought the history was an error in the scriptures and that they were trying to fix it with, to make it agree with history, that they would make slight changes like 100 here, 100 there, altering it like that. Uh, there's not the same reason for motivation to subtract 100 years. Um, if you're trying to, uh, 
Like it wouldn't make sense to say, oh yeah, the scriptures are in line with history. Let's remove a hundred years so that it's no longer accurate with history. You see, that to me is a good motivation uh, for the scribes. Uh, hey, Navio, can you mute your... Hey, thank you. Um, so I think that's a good motivation uh, to explain why the Septuagint has so much more years added because they were trying to reconcile it with, with history, but trying to change as little as possible without altering the actual numbers. They were trying to change it by hundreds. If you change it by a hundred, you're altering it only slightly. Um, so that, that's my perspective on the numbers there. Um, and so if you take Jubilee's um, numbers with the totals of the Samaritan, we have, with the exception of Eber and Peleg, everyone dies before their son dies, like in the Septuagint. So you know how I said that's a plus. The Septuagint, I mean, yeah, the Septuagint has a plus, a positive aspect of it, in that each son dies after their father dies, which is how you naturally would expect it. That's the same thing in Jubilees, with the exception of only two people, Eber and Peleg. So I think Jubilees and Septuagint have a plausible father-son uh, transmission. So now, another thing in, in um, basically, we have um, some other details in the scriptures that can help us realize that the Septuagint and Samaritan are an error for the cha chapter 11, for how old they were when they had a son. And the, the, the error is as follows. It says, Ab Abraham said, shall a man who is a hundred have a son? And in the Septuagint and Samaritan, all the way up until Abraham, people who are more than a hundred are having a son, which does not make sense with Abraham's statement. With the Masoretic, it does make sense, and with Jubilees, it does make sense. Because in Jubilees and Masoretic, in chapter 11, uh, chapter 11 of, of Genesis for Masoretic, and in the Jubilees throughout, everyone after Shem has a son a good amount less than 100 years old. Typically, in Jubilees, it's around the 60s. Um, let's see. Uh, so in Jubilees, um, do I have it here? Yeah. So let me just say for the Masoretic, the... The, the numbers for Masoretic are, for how old they were when they, when they had a son, are 35, then 30, 34, 30, 32, 30, 29, 70. It's a big jump. Um, and, of course, Abraham was 100 um, when, he had, when he had Isaac. Jubilees, however, has these numbers. It has 65, 57. 71 or 70, right around there, uh, 64, 60, 59, 57, 63, 70. So that's more consistent. It's all right around 60, 70-ish, which is right where Tara was when he had their son, uh, his son. Um, but with the Masoretic, it's all low numbers, like 30s. Even one, one of them was 29. That's really low. But then it jumps up to 70. And then it jumps up to 100 for Abraham. If it's all around 60 and 70, that's more consistent. Um, so let's let's see. Is that that's pretty much? Uh, let me see. Is there anything else? Yeah, that's pretty much it for the for the numbers of uh, the genealogies. But now I'm going to discuss the the age of Abraham in Jubilees, um, or when, when, when Abraham was born in Jubilees. There, there's a problem in Jubilees. There are corruptions. Uh, sometimes, sometimes there are uh, passages in Jubilees where the, where the numbers are in error. But the reason we know they're in error is because the, the overall context and flow has the correct numbers. 
So like if you have if you have like a number line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like you're counting all the way up. If someone says, I'm gonna count to 100, and they start counting to 100, and then when they get to 53, they accidentally say 57, and then they go back to 55, you know that 57 is the one that's up wrong. 57 is the one that's wrong. It should be 54, because the, the pattern in the, in the surrounding context is what keep adding one every time because you're counting to 100, one, two, three, four, all the way to 100. So if you're, if you're at 53, followed by 57, followed by 55, then you know that 57 is an error and that must be 54. That's how Jubilees works. Jubilees has most of the dates accurate. A few of the dates are incorrect, but the surrounding context helps you know, okay, that was a mistake there. With Abraham's life, some of the numbers are inaccurate in our copies of manuscripts of Jubilees. And I believe the reason for that is because Genesis says that, um, like, okay, so for example, for Noah, it says, Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's what Genesis says. So, wait a minute. Noah was 500 years old, and he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So does that mean they were, they were triplets? Well, no. According to Jubilees, they were born two years apart from each other, each of them. So Shem was born in uh, Ham or Japheth two years later, and then the other one two years after that. But Genesis just simply abbreviates it and says, Noah was 500 years and, and, and had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. According to Jubilees, Noah was 500 years old when he had Shem, and then two years after had the one and two years after had the other. So Genesis is abbreviating and simply simplifying and saying he was 500 when he started having kids, and he had, the kids he had were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The same thing is happening in Genesis for, um, for the sons of Terah, and that would be, it says, no, uh, excuse me, Terah lived 70 years, and we got Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So it's not clear how old was Terah when he had Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Jubilees doesn't actually tell us how old he was when he had Nahor and Haran. It only tells us how old he was when he had Abram. The problem is how old he was when he had, when he had Abram according to Terah, uh, excuse me, when he had Abraham according to Jubilees, um, that conflicts with the other dates of Jubilees. So from my perspective, because Genesis is not clear, I believe that it makes sense that, a, that the scribes were looking at Jubilees. They knew that Genesis said uh, Terah was 70 years old when he had Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And they assumed that that meant that Terah was 70 years old when he, when he had Abram. So they altered the text of Jubilees to make it say that uh, that Terah was 70 years old when he had Abram. And that, because that changed, that threw all the numbers into error. So then the scribes were like, oh no, what's going on? The numbers are not adding up in Jubilees. They're inconsistent. So in some places, the scribes changed it to reflect Abraham being born when Terah was 70. However, uh, there's, uh, there's a good amount of evidence that Ter uh, Abraham was actually um, born when Terah was 75 years old, not 70 years old. And one of the things supporting that, for example, is, um, you know, in, you know how it says in, um, in, in the letter of, I think it's Galatians, it says, the covenant with Moses was made 430 years after the covenant with Abraham. That number 430, um, when you take that number and you take what Jubilee says when uh, Moses, uh, when the covenant was given, that was in the year 4,000, uh, excuse me, 2,411. When you subtract 430, that brings you to 1981. Okay, 1981. That's when Isaac was born, because that's when the covenant was made. And Abraham was 100 years old, so 1981 subtract 100, that would be Abraham being born 1881. And 
some of the passages of Jubilees actually say that Abraham was born in 1881 after creation. So I believe that is the correct, that um, Abraham was born when Terah was 75 and not 70. And I think that's where the numbers got messed up in Jubilees. So that's my theory on trying to make sense of the con conflicting numbers in Jubilees about when Abraham was born. Do you mean 2081, not 1881? Um, uh, no, because um, uh, in Jubilees, it actually has a little bit earlier. It actually has, um, it has. Um, well, you said 2411 minus 430 is 1881. Abraham would have been 100. Um, so then if he was born 100 years earlier, it would be, it would be 2081 and not. Okay, so, okay, so 2411. Minus 400 is 2011. Minus 30 is 1981. That's when Abraham was 100 years old. And then you, you subtract 100 to get when Abraham was born, and that's 1881. No, you go the other way. Uh, you want to If he was 100 years old at 1981, we're going backwards because this is BC, not AD. No, no, this, I, we're using a different, we're not using BC, we're using, um, it's like AC, it's called. It's basically, Got it. um, okay. Got it's, it. it's counting up from the year of creation according to the, what the Bible claims the year of creation is, or at least, at least the year when Adam, oh, Adam no, was formed. Got it, got yeah, it. Yeah, okay. so that's the confusion. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so 2,411 years after creation was when Jubilee says, uh, the covenant was made with Mo uh, Moses. Galatians says it was 430 years prior when the covenant with Abraham was made. Subtract 430 from 2411, you get 1981. And subtract 100 to get when Abraham was born, you get 1881. And that agrees with some passages of Jubilees uh, for Abraham. Because as I said, the passages in Jubilees contradict each other for Abraham's information. Because, and I think the reason for that is they, the scribes got confused with what Genesis says about how Terah was 70 years old when he had Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Uh, so hopefully that clarifies. Now, um, the next little stuff, I think, I think what I'm going to be able to do is like I have an outline here of some of the information, and I think I'm going to end with um, end with the information of of like the names of Abraham's family because that's a very interesting stuff. So I'm going to go into the names now. This is very interesting things uh, that Jubilees reveals to us. So um, so first of all, it says that you know. You know Ur of the Chaldees. In Hebrew, it's Kesed or Kesedim. It says that Canaan, uh, which is, it is, Canaan is um, Shem's grandson. Okay, so Canaan's um, brother was Kesed. Then Canaan had a son named Shelah. And uh, let's see, let me... Uh, let me just see. Um, I'm looking at Jubilees. Okay. Sheila married a woman named Muak. And Muak was the daughter of Kesed. Okay. So, um, so there's the connection right there. Then, then we have Aber. And I'm sorry about the noise in the background, the dogs, but, uh, so Eber took a wife, and the wife's name was Azarad. And Azarad is the, the daughter of Nimrod. Jubilees actually says Eber, the Eber of the righteous line, married Nimrod's own daughter. So that's a very interesting connection. And that basically is Jubilees saying that Every, all the Jews, 
all the Israelites have Nimrod's blood in them. That's a very interesting information. Um, because some people believe Nimrod's blood was corrupted by like Nephilim. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I don't think that's the case. So um, Jubilee tells us that Nimrod's descendants intermarried very early on. So that means all the Hebrews, because Hebrews are descended from Eber. So all Hebrews are have the blood of Nimrod because Eber married Nimrod's daughter. So All right, very, let me ask you a question. Sure. Was this the same Eber that was married to Yael? Um, who the, would Yael be? Yael was the lady who um, pounded a stake through the head of... Who is that? No, that's a different one. That's, that's like a from, different one. Yeah, okay. that's, I, th I think that's Jabber. Um, or something. I, I haven't looked at that in a while, oh. but that's that's in the, ju the book of Judges. No, he says um, they came into Eber's tent. Oh, really? Eber was gone. Yes, and I'm trying to think of who, who that was. The head of the Assyrians. Okay, but yeah, that's from a later time. She gave him milk, and he fell asleep, and, and uh, she did away with her. So that was later on? Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. And you know that they, in the Bible, they always repeat names all throughout. Yeah. So, so it's a later person there. Um, Peleg, who did who did Peleg marry? Peleg's um, wife was Lamna, the daughter of Shinar. And what is Shinar? Well, we know that there was a place called Shinar, in um in uh it says in genesis chapter 10 again connecting with nimrod it says nimrod began his kingdom uh, the beginning of his kingdom was babel erech akkad kalna in the land of shinar so uh jubilee says that uh peleg married the daughter of shinar so it's just like there's a land of the kesedim and that ultimately comes from an actual man named Kesed. So also the land of Shinar is linked with an actual man named Shinar. Uh, same thing with the Canaanites, come from an actual man named Canaan, and that's where the, the land was called Canaan. Um, so now we look at Reu, and Reu, Reu's wife is a woman named Ura, and Ura is the daughter of Ur, and Ur is a son of Kesed. So when did, well, hold on, hello. Um, this is my mom. Okay, so Ur of the Chaldees, Ur of Kesedim. That is essentially, that is originating according to Jubilees, Ur, the son of Kesed, and Reu married Ur's daughter. Now we have now we have Saruk. Um, let's see, Saruk. Um, okay, Saruk married Milka, daughter of Keber, and Keber was was Reu's brother. Uh, so, so I believe that he, that means Sarah was marrying his cousin. Okay. Um, now, now this is going to be cool. I'm going to, I'm going to reveal some interesting stuff in a second, but I just want to read these other things here. Nahor, um, Nahor married a woman named, according to Jubilees, it's Ijaska, Ijaska, uh, that sounds random, right? What, who's Ijaska? Um, I'm going to reveal who Ijaska was in a minute. It says Ijaska, though, was the daughter of Nest, Nestag of the Chaldees. So that's, again, connected with Kesedim. Kesed. Um, what's interesting is that the Book of Giants actually has a name similar to Nestag. It has Naxtag, 
and another name tax tag. So that's a possible connection there. So uh, nest tag is the woman's name. And no, I'm sorry, is the man's name. Nest tag is the man's name, the father of Iaska or Iasika. Now, Tara, here's where it starts getting really cool. This is like, Genesis gives us information about people's names, but it doesn't explain why it's telling us these things. It's like, okay, who cares? I don't care about that information. Um, but with Jubilees, everything starts making sense. It's like, oh, that's why Genesis says that. Oh, okay. So um, Tara married a woman named Edna, and Edna was the daughter of a man named Abram. Okay, and Jubilees tells us, why was Abram named Abram? He was named Abram because of his grandfather's name, Abram. So Abraham was named after his grandfather, his mom's dad. And his mom's dad, it says in Jubilees, the reason was because his mom's dad died before she had a son. So she, when she had a son, she decided to name him, they decided to name him Abram after the honor of her dad that had died. So that's a cool uh, little detail that we don't get in Genesis, but that we do get in Jubilees. Now, what's, what supports Jubilees' take on this is that it's, it suggests that Abraham's entire family, like you know how families have like tradition, naming traditions? Well, according to Jubilees, Abraham's family liked to name their, their children after their ancestors. It's kind of really cool. So I'm going to point out these cool things. It says that in Genesis, it tells us that who Haran's daughters were. Okay, so Haran's daughters were, it says, Haran was the father of Milka and Iska. So Haran, Haran was one of the sons of Terah. Haran had two daughters as well as his son Lot, but his two daughters were Milka and Iska. And what did we see here? We saw that, um, we saw that, um, let's see here. Okay, so basically I'll tell you what all this means. That means Abraham was named after his, after uh, his mom's dad, okay? Nahor, Abraham had a brother named Nahor. And remember, Terah's dad was named Nahor. So Nahor was named after, after um, his dad's dad. Abraham's dad's dad. So Abraham was married after his mom's dad. And Nahor was married after his dad's dad. Now, Milka, which is Haran's, uh, Haran's, um, Haran's daughter, Milka, is named after her paternal two times great grandmother. So Nahor's mom, so Terah, remember Terah's father was Nahor. Nahor's uh, mom was named Milka. Because remember I said earlier, um, I said Serug married Milka, the daughter of Keber. So that means Nahor's, Serug had a son named Nahor, and Nahor's mother was Milka, because Milka married Serug. And so Haran's daughter Milka is being named after his uh, great, great, uh, let's see, his great, great uh, grandmother. No, uh, his great grandmother uh, and his daughter's great, great grandmother. So, and then the same thing for Iska. Iska was Haran's other daughter, and that's Terah's mom. So Abraham's dad, Terah, Terah, his mom was named, remember I said Ijaska? Iyasaka? That's linked to, to the Hebrew Iska. So Jubilees kind of garbles the name Ijaska, but when you connect it with Genesis, we know the original Hebrew is Iska and not Ijaska. Um, 
So that's a very cool link that we're seeing here. All the, all the family of Abraham is being named after ancestors. Um, and then, uh, Jackson, did I, um, when you say editing, are you talking about editing in the, in the, uh, the recording or what oh, I'm, I'm just saying that what you're presenting here is so deep and, uh, complicated. I mean, it's, I'm just going to edit it some in order to. For a, for like clear. a. Yeah. Oh, okay. A little clearer. That's all. All right. Um, I just wanted to let you know. Okay. Before you, before you do that, can you send me the unedited version? Sure. All right. That'd be great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify with that. All right. And, um, we don't know, for, for example, we don't know why Heron was named Heron. We don't have information on that. We don't know why Sarai was named Sarai. Um, uh, Sarai was one of the daughters of Terah from another wife, according to, according to Genesis. We don't know who, who Terah's other wife was, um, his second wife. We don't know. We don't know who uh, Lot was named after. But based on the principle that we see in Jubilees, it's very plausible that Heron was named after a family relative, maybe an uncle or something like that. Um, Sarai was probably also named after one of her aunts or something, or one of her grandmothers. Uh, like maybe Sarai was named after, uh, like since Sarai came from a different wife of Tara, just like Abraham's, um, Abraham was named after his mom's, uh, dad, it's possible that Sarai was named after her mom's mom, but we don't know for certain. That's just speculation. But that whole principle of naming their kids after family relatives that would be very plausible. And for yeah, for Lot, it could be after uh, after Tara's brother or Tara's uncle. We don't know exactly, but um, there is a, however, an interesting thing where after Haran dies they move to the land of Haran. It most likely was not, it most likely did not have that name. Um, it probably only came to have that name because they just, uh, Abraham and Terah decided to name that land after Haran that died. So that land, when it says they, in Genesis and Jubilee that they moved to Haran, most likely it didn't have that name originally and they, they just named it after Haran in honor of him. Uh, and then there's also a place, in, according to Jubilees, there's a place called Boa Lot. And it's possible that that, that, that was named after Lot. Maybe Boa Lot, the place Boa Lot, was named after Lot or something. We don't know exactly. But we do, have, we do see this principle in Jubilees connected with Genesis where places are named after people or people are named after places. We, we, see, we see this connection. So, uh, Canaan in the land of Canaan, Haran, land of Har Haran, uh, all these different things we see. Uh, uh, Kesedim, Ur of the Chaldees, Ur is the son of Kesed, he built a city, and that's Ur of the Kesedim. Uh, Shinar, I mentioned, was from a man that was actually named Shinar. So, we've got all these clues and jubilees connecting us that. These were actual people. These lands were actual uh, people, uh, based on actual people, uh, according to Jubilees. So one final thing, and I think this might be a good place to end it. Um, another, another thing is, um, you know how I mentioned how the scribes would change things to make it agree with the numbers, the genealogy numbers to make it agree. Well, there are church fathers or Christian writers um, such as a man by the name of George Sincellus or Sincellus. He wrote in Greek a history of the world and he used the scriptures as one of his primary sources. He also used Jubilees. He believed that Jubilees had historical information in it that, that, that could be trusted 
in certain aspects, but that Jubilee was corrupted, and that some of what Jubilee said could not be fully trusted. So he starts off copying what Jubilee says for the dates, and then something interesting happens. Then George Simkelis starts adding hundreds of years, just like we see in the Septuagint, with 100 years added in places, to make it longer, make the, make the history longer. George Simkelis is taking the information from Jubilees and he's adding 100 years onto it all throughout his chronology um, because he's trying to make it closer to the Septuagint. So he's actually, he actually takes the numbers of Jubilees and alters it to try to force it to fit what the Septuagint, closer to what the Septuagint says. So that's an example where you see the original text of Jubilees and now you have a scribe with, a, with an agenda who's taking Jubilee's information and altering, twisting it to make it what he thinks history was. And that's what I believe happened with Genesis. The same thing happened. Just like they were altering what the information of Jubilees was in that chronology of Sinkelis, the scribes are doing the same thing with the book of Genesis, altering it to force it to fit their particular view of what history was. So that's a lot of evidence to support that there was something really tricky going on with Genesis and that the scribes, there has to be some type of, I don't like to use the word conspiracy, but it's in a sense it's appropriate in the text of Genesis where there was an intentional alteration of Genesis to make it agree with a particular perspective uh, of what they thought the truth was. They actually altered what the text said because they didn't like or agree with what it said. And there's certain justification for that. If the, if the text is clearly an error, a scribe's job is to try to fix it. Unfortunately, scribes too often are, are wrong in what they think the error is, and it's actually not an error, but they alter it to make it say something even more an error. So Jubilees is key to reconstructing what the Torah originally actually said, and it's very important for textual criticism for the Torah purposes. We, we've talked about in the Ahad, like the whole thing with the documentary hypothesis and um, textual criticism for the Torah. And I think using Jubilees is important for reconstructing what the original Torah said, uh, what Genesis through Deuteronomy said, and Dead Sea Scrolls as well. So using Dead Sea Scrolls and Jubilees, Samaritan and Septuagint, they're all key sources to try to reconstruct. Uh, that, that's the imp one of the big importance of Jubilees is all that information that gives us on filling in holes of Genesis because Genesis, uh, as I said, it just tells us randomly. It says, the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. Like, why is it telling us Haran's daughters? Who, who cares? What's the point of mentioning their daughters, of Haran's daughters? Well, the reason it's telling us those information is because just like, as I said before in other teachings, like Genesis chapter 6, it's, it gives us very, very small information. The reason it gives us so tiny information is because it expects you already know the story and know the information from another source. Like Enoch walked with God and he was not. Why does it say that little, little snippet? Because the author of Genesis understood, yeah, you have the book of Enoch, you know the whole story, I don't need to repeat the whole thing for you. I'm just going to tell you, Enoch walked with God and he was not. Because you know the rest of the story. Same thing with the sons of God coming to, this, to the daughters of man. You know that story, I'm just going to give you a very bare bones account of it. So we have the same thing in Genesis uh, for the, some of the genealogy stuff. It's giving you a little bit of detail but it's not giving you the full story. It's saying, yeah, you, you know some of this stuff. And when you take Jubilees combined with Genesis and you combine it, you see this amazing story of the family of Abraham, naming their, their family members after their ancestors. So that's, I think it's really insightful. Anyone want to say anything or have any comments or questions? Very thought-provoking. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, what, what's your what, what's your guys' take on Jubilees? But did some was someone going just going to say something? Well, it's was always that? amazing to me that they 
just overlooked this completely, uh, the Jews did, for canonical information. I mean, it's like it's a lost book, yet it was prevalent in the time it was written and up 300 years later. Just I'm amazed that um, this wasn't even considered for the canon. And yeah, the, Enoch was, I guess, because it was a different strain of religion than the people that were canonizing. I think what you have, I think the problem what you have is that you have, uh, what you had was, like, according to Second Ezra, you had, like, the, the secret books and the public books, and so it appears that, you know, the, the people who didn't have access to some of these books, uh, they didn't have that information to go on, so they were free to alter, they were free to speculate because they didn't have those other sources. Um, so that could explain why it wasn't considered for canon because you know, like, you know how the Protestants do it. They're very much tradition. They're like, the books we received are the books we receive. Da, 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 da. Um, it's probably something similar with the Jews. The Jews received from, like the Pharisees, they received from their forefathers these books. So these are the books they received these books, like from their fathers, and those fathers received those books. So um, you had the, like the Essenes or the people, the Dead Sea Scrolls or the, the priest or whoever were preserving the, the entire literature. And then you had the Pharisees who were only preserving a small portion of the literature. They were just, the Pharisees were just accepting what was handed down to them. And um, the same thing with the Christians. They were just accepting these are the books that were given to us. These are canon. Everything else we can't, we don't trust because we don't know where they came from. That's probably yeah. what happened. That Thank would be you. my theory. So uh, in your opinion, who is the author of Jubilees? What individual or what group? Um, I come from the radical perspective that Jubilees was actually authored by Moses or, or uh, it, it purports to be from the angel, but it, it looks like it looks like it's suggesting that Moses actually wrote down what the angel was dictating to him. And that does line up with what, like, for example, Paul and Acts suggest that the law actually came from the angels. Uh, that, that lines up in that sense. But um, I'm in no way suggesting that the Dead Sea School copies of Jubilees or the Ethiopian copy of Jubilees is a perfect present of the original it's very if Jubilees was actually the original was actually written by Moses that's like what uh, 1500 years or 1400 years however many years before the Dead Sea Scrolls so in a in that time period a lot can be corrupted and altered um, so I'm not suggesting that the book of Jubilees that we have is Everything in the aim of Jubilees is what Moses wrote, but I'm suggesting that there's like a core nucleus that Jubilees is based on, a previous uh, source that was probably very similar to Jubilees. I've also mentioned there's evidence that Book of Jubilees was based on an earlier Book of Jubilees that was written according to Abraham. Uh, so Jubilees does appear to be like a compilation of different sources. Like it, it suggests it derives from the Enoch, Genesis of the Apocryphon, Testaments of the Patriarchs. So it, it's like a conglomeration of the different accounts. So to, to determine when Jubilees was written, you kind of have to base it on when were these other books written. Book of Enoch, when was that? If the Book of Enoch has a late date, then Jubilees must have a late date as well because Jubilees is clearly secondary to Enoch. Uh, that's overwhelming evidence for that. But if Enoch, if the core nucleus of Enoch stems back to the man Enoch and Enoch actually wrote it, it's possible that Jubilees also stems back to a core nucleus by Moses. But then, of course, over time, accretions are added by scribes, sometimes even whole, whole chapters that should not be there. What uh, in the book of Jubilees makes you think that it is uh, partially linked to the 12 patriarchs? Oh, um... So there's actually a test, like there's some writings called the Testaments of the... Right, Patriarchs. that's what I'm asking. And uh, there's some similarities which are too coincidental. Like they're, they're too lining up to be coincidence. They have to be based on either, one has to be based on the other, or 
they both have to be based on a common source. Uh, and there is evidence like for the Testament of Levi, there's a document in the Dead Sea Scrolls called Aramaic Levi. Um, and that's an older version of the Testament of Levi. And that older version has striking agreements with Jubilees, uh, the, the account for Levi and Jubilees. So um, there's also an, another thing is the account of Moses' dad named Amram. There's an account of Amram, Amram, like a book of Amram, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in fragments. But the story of Amram in those fragments strikingly lines up with the story of Amram in the Book of Jubilees. So it, it appears that Jubilees is having tons of allusions and, and references to all these other books. That's what it makes most sense to me. If Jubilees is compiling all these information from, like it says it, it got information from Enoch, Book of Noah, Book of Abraham, uh, it would make sense that it's also getting information from these other books too. That, that's why I think that. Cool, thanks. Yep. Uh, Jackson, you said Beyond the Essene Hypothesis is the book that gets into this. What does it get into? It gets into where the books come from. Of course, it's speculation, but the author of this book, Bocaccini, is he's the head of the International Scrolls thing right now, and he... Um, takes the literature, the literature of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he's able to analyze it and come up with different strains, we might say different denominations of literature that uh, predated the Qumran people. And this, this book is a, it's, it's a wonderful book for anybody that would read it. It's very short, easy to read, but it really puts a lot of these uh, pseudographical works into the perspective of a greater movement. So we have that in our library if anybody's interested in it. I can send you an e-copy. All right, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Any so, other stuff relevant, like any other PDFs? Or do you think that's the main one? Gobs of them, yeah. In our library, which we're trying to put out now, we have, well, I've been cherry-picking off uh, academia.edu and scribe.com for quite some time on documents like this and there are some really good ones there. We're just in the process of coding them and putting them in categories. So you know if anybody's doing research on Essenes or something like that and they want to get into Scribed or Academia, there are some great papers that aren't necessarily published there. A lot of PhD dissertations and so forth on these subjects. And if you want to look something up, just let me know and I'll, I'll give you my login information on it. It looks yeah. like everyone commented that they're interested. Okay. Or not everybody, but... I want to ask you if you would be so kind as to send me an email. The, the people who are interested? Uh, the people who are interested, send me an email. So... I can have your information and all. And my email address, you can send it to Vero Yahad uh, at gmail.com. I've got that in the chat then, and I'll, I'll get that over to you. All right. Uh, this, is, this is the best book that I've ever seen on this particular subject and the easiest to read. It's like Michael Clark actually has that book as his... Uh, profile picture the beyond the Essene hypothesis one? yeah because he's you know it's such an impressive book and you learn so much in regards to the different sex proto sex that came before and uh the the tide we might say of these different uh books which ones go together which ones are not specifically Qumran material and just so much more and I'm sorry that uh, these, this series is taking so long, but it, there's just so much, there's so much uh, depth to go in the Book of Jubilees. It, that's why it's taking so long. But well, that's okay. I guess it'll give you lots of stuff for your show. You're still uploading the shows to your... Oh, yeah. Very good. All right, guys, thank you so much. Anything you, else? Brother. Anything final anyone wants to say? 
doesn't look like it. If anyone else wants to comment on uh, stuff, they can, uh, it's like they had a question about something I said or something, they can always message me on Facebook or something.